Well, we're delighted this evening to be able to wank, uh, welcome a gentleman who, uh, from Chase Manhattan Bank, um, from the international side of that operation, <laughs> as opposed to domestic acquisitions. It, it's, it's enjoyable to introduce him because his resume is, is, a, is a pleasant one to, to note. It's one of uh, nice accomplishment and uh, decent public service. Uh, Mr. Stankard, after graduating from uh, Holy Cross uh, College and serving the Marines, joined Chase Manhattan in 1955. Uh, he had nice success with the organization. Uh, in 1966, he was named uh, one of the outstanding young men in America. In 1967, he was awarded a Public Affairs Fellowship at the Brookings Institute in, in Washington. Upon returning to the bank, he was named executive of the Commodity Financing Division of the International Department. And then he was promoted to senior vice president and appointed group executive in Asia and Australia in 1970. The additional responsibility of the Middle East was given to him two years later. And after attending the Harvard International Senior Managers Program in Switzerland, he was named group executive for Europe in 1974. He was appointed executive vice president and international banking executive in 1975. And he assumed his present position, which is, of course, chairman of Chase Manhattan Capital Markets Corporation uh, in December of 1984. He uh, serves as the a trustee, a member of the board of trustees at Holy Cross at the Christian Brothers Academy a member of the President's Council at Marymount Manhattan College. He's a member of the Advisory Council of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and the Graduate School of International Management, Thunderbird, in Arizona. He's also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a director of the Asia Society and the Institute for the Advancement of, of Health. So it's with an interest in public service, in things international, and a great deal of experience in the realm of international finance that Mr. Stankard comes to us this evening. The title of uh, his address will be You to America, which as a Jesuit trained gentleman will be in Latin, of course. <laughs> I'm very glad to be here. For those of you who don't know it, the weather in Baltimore is terrible. The helicopter pilot said he couldn't make it here. Uh, the, uh, but I'm glad that the guffaw was given about my not knowing anything about merit, because if you had asked me fast enough, I'm sorry to say I probably wouldn't have known the name. Uh, <laughs> I understand no one's going to believe it, but it happens to be true what he said. Uh, the, you know, he's really quite a salesman. He called one day and he said, uh, you believe in free speech? <laughs> so anyhow, here I am giving a free speech. <laughs> and with uh, all that stuff about those schools and the Jesuits and stuff. Reminds me of the story of that was a, a gentleman in a smaller town in the United States that had made a lot of money. And he was a very prudent fellow, very. And so he sat down and uh, tried to figure out whether or not money, as he got way up in years, was any good on the other side. And he was having a hell of a time and he couldn't do it. So one night he called in the local priest, or rabbi, minister, and priest. And you understand, you've got to tell that depending on who you are. Uh, uh, so uh, he said, look it, I can't figure this out. And but being very prudent, I want you to know I've taken care of everybody, lots of money to charity and so forth. But I still can't figure it out. So I would like to give you three men of the cloth, each $50,000. And when I die and you come to the wake, you know, just drop it in the coffin as you go by. That way, if I need it, it's good. If I don't need it, no one's ever going to miss it. <laughs> so anyhow, some time goes by, and the gentleman dies. And then the three clergymen are having dinner one night. And all of a sudden, the minister says, I can't stand it anymore. Can't stand it. What? 
You remember Joe and the $50,000? Yeah. You remember the parsonage burned down? Yeah. He said, well, I got to tell you, I used the $50,000 to rebuild the parsonage. So the rabbi says, oh, okay, if that's the kind of evening it's going to be. <laughs> he said, I got to admit that the last two rooms on our Jewish center were built with Joe's $50,000. <laughs> so the priest says nothing. So finally, the minister says, what about you? The priest says, I'm shocked, absolutely shocked. Men of the cloth, Joe trusted you to put the money in the coffin. One builds a house, the other builds a school. I'm really amazed. So the rabbi says, oh, come on, Father. Are you going to tell us you dropped that $50,000 in the coffin? He said, you bet there's a check for $50,000. <laughs> Anyhow, an <laughs> enough of that stuff. It will be here all night. Uh, anyhow, oh, I for keep forgetting. I've now joined the ranks. Right? Okay. The writing of history, E. H. Carr once observed, has a dual and reciprocal function: to promote our understanding of the past in the light of the present, and of the present in the light of the past. With the international debt problem now some 11 years old. I think it a good time to look back, to calmly and rationally analyze its causes, to try to determine where we are. This I will do this afternoon. I will also talk about why the debt problem was so severe in Latin America and almost non-existent in Asia. Furthermore, every day I become more aware that many of the same trends are emerging in our own country. Consequently, I will also say a few words about this situation. The global debt problem basically came from forces dating back to the mid-1970s. The 1982 debt crisis derived primarily from the effects of the world recession. It was made more severe by psychological shocks to world credit markets <coughs> caused by events in individual countries. In a broad sense, the problem is a consequence of the transition from inflation to disinflation. Funds that were borrowed when inflation was high and real interest rates low or negative were quite suddenly no longer cheap in an environment of lower inflation and high real interest rates. Consequently, while there might have been excesses of both borrowers and lenders, in the main, what was done was rational, not foolish. Darrell Delamide in his book about this subject writes, everybody knew the crisis was coming. Academics knew. The countries knew, even the bankers knew, especially those bankers knew. This kind of talk implies that there were a great many incredibly dense or naive people in this world, including me, busily doing things that they knew would shortly give them a gigantic headache. I don't really think so. Indeed, I know of no individual or group of people who predicted the confluence of events that led to the situation in which we found ourselves. Mr. Delamide reminds me of one of those Jesuit professors who started off his class with, now, we're not here to find out what you think, and we're not here to find out what I think. We're here to find out what God thinks. And then, of course, he proceeded to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> International debt of non-oil developing countries rose fivefold from 1973 to 1982. After deducting for inflation, the real debt of these countries rose only by a multiple of 2.1. <coughs> Considering that the real growth of their gross domestic product averaged 4.5 percent per annum for these years, the weight of external debt relative to domestic production rose only from 22 to 35 percent. Because their exports grew more rapidly than GDP, the ratio of external debt to exports of goods and services rose even less from 115% in 1973 to 143% in 1982. But due primarily to higher interest rates, the debt service burden rose from an average of 15% of exports of goods and services in 1973 to 77 to 22% in the years 1981 and 82. To be sure, some of this increase in the debt service burden was attributable, at least until 1980, to a higher inflationary component of interest rates. 
Higher inflation tends to cause higher interest rates. But higher inflation also <coughs> erodes the real value of the debt that eventually is to be repaid. Consequently, high interest rates caused primarily by high inflation demand a greater present cash flow burden in return for eroding the real value of the outstanding debt. In effect, in real terms, they cause an accelerated amortization of the debt. Through most of the 1970s, the adjusted real debt service ratio, that is, deducting the er erosionary inflationary erosion of principle, was considerably lower than the nominal debt service ratio. It made sense for countries to borrow. By 1981 to 82, nominal interest rates were high while inflation was declining. As a result, the adjusted real ratio rose from minus 1.6% in 1974 to a record 11.7% in 1981. It then nearly doubled to 22.3% in 1982 as inflation fell sharply while interest rates fell more slowly. The ball game had changed. It now made little sense for countries to borrow. Unfortunately, the debt was there, two-thirds of it at floating interest rates. The single most important cause of the international debt burden of non-oil developing countries was the sharp rise in the cost of oil in 1973 and 4, and again in 1979 and 80. The value of oil imports rose from 6% of total merchandise imports in 1973 to 20% in 1982. Higher oil prices then set the stage for the heavy debt burden of many countries in the last decade. The high interest rates of 1980 to 82 precipitated the debt crisis. Coinciding with and a considerable degree because of high real interest rates, the international economy experienced severe recession from 1980 to 1983. From 1973 to 1979, real growth in industrial countries averaged 3.2 percent per annum. It fell to 1.2 percent in 1980 and plummeted to minus 0.3 percent in 1983. In addition to these serious outside shocks from the world economy, individual country policy errors contributed to the deterioration of the debt situation. Mexico allowed the peso to become severely overvalued. Throughout the 1970s, Brazil consciously followed a risky strategy of pursuing high growth based on rapid accumulation of debt. In Argentina, a policy of pre-announcing exchange rate devaluation by less than the rate of domestic inflation led to a vastly overvalued peso, high imports, poor export performance, and a tremendous flight of capital. International debt problems were aggravated by psychological shifts in the credit market. In both Eastern Europe and Latin America, a debt servicing breakdown by one major country led rapidly to restricted capital flows to the rest of the region. Consider Latin America. First went Argentina, then Mexico. The whole area became suspect. Financiers began to withdraw credits from Brazil. In August of 1982, Brazil was doing well in the international financial markets. By November, it couldn't borrow a thing. Why? An interesting question. After all, in 1981, Ireland had a per capita foreign indebtedness higher than either Poland or Mexico. It had no trouble borrowing then or since. My mother sees nothing strange about that statement. <laughs> Why the crisis in Latin America? Why not Southeast Asia? The areas were similar in many respects. Each was composed of fast-growing, diverse countries. Each had an abundance of well-educated technocrats. Each wanted a better life for its people. Why the difference? I believe there are four reasons. First, the areas followed different models of development. The Asians followed the export-driven route, the Latins import substitution. Both borrowed extensively to finance growth. The Asians to manufacture exports, the Latins to expand domestic industries behind protective tariff walls. When the oil price hikes came, the Asians were gradually able to raise the price of their exported goods to obtain more dollars to pay for the oil. To pay for the increased interest rates, they did more of the same. The Latins were trapped. 
they had insufficient manufactured exports with which to compensate. Second, Latin America, with the possible exception of Brazil, followed an overvalued exchange rate policy. This is the equivalent of, us of using oil to put out a fire. If the value of a currency changes to reflect its true purchasing power, it serves as an adjusting mechanism to reduce imports when the value of the currency declines. An overvalued currency allows imports to increase at just the time the country can least afford it, and it makes its exports less competitive. Asian countries are primarily interested in the competitiveness of their exports. They avoid an overvalued currency. Indeed, they try to keep it somewhat undervalued. A concomitant problem of an overvalued exchange rate is capital flight. No matter what controls a country installs, if the people believe that the currency is overvalued, they will discover ways to preserve their wealth by moving out of their own currency into an undervalued one. Capital flight contributed at least one-third of total debt in Venezuela and Argentina and approximately one-fifth in Mexico. Third, Latins borrowed more than Asians, much more. Thus, in 1982, Korea had a ratio of net debt to exports of but 104 percent. Indonesia, only 86 percent, compared to Brazil's 365 percent and Mexico's 273 percent. Fourth and finally, there's a long tradition of such financial brinksmanship in this part of the world. Latin American countries began borrowing and defaulting as soon as they gained independence in the 1820s. A Scottish adventurer who had sought, uh, fought under Simon Bolivar succeeded in floating a 200,000 pound issue for the largely mythical kingdom of Poias, ostensibly a country in Central America. Gregor McGregor, the Prince of Poias, made off with the proceeds of the issue and was never heard of again. <laughs> Poias never paid a coupon, but then neither did La Gran Colombia, the very real country founded by Bolivar. La Gran Colombia later split up into Bolivia, Ecuador, and Colombia. It was an Argentine payments crisis in the 1840s that nearly caused the collapse of the great British merchant bank Bering Brothers. It was rescued by the Bank of England. This background, I'm convinced, contributed to the tremendous psychological effects suffered by Latin America in 1982 and 1983. In the summer of 1982, I suggested that this debt crisis was the most serious situation ever to face multinational commercial banking. I said that we were in for years of dawn-to-dawn -dawn meetings, endless negotiations, torrents of lawyers, lots of brinksmanship, lots of missed due dates, lots of work, lots of drama, and lots of holding of breath. But the world financial system would not topple. We would muddle through country by country rather than by achieving a worldwide, all-encompassing solution. That the trick would be not to have these countries reduce their debt to zero, but rather to restore the confidence of the world so that the debt would revolve and indeed so that the countries could get increased funds over the years. Three years later, this is exactly what has happened. Of course, if it hadn't, I wouldn't tell you what I said. <laughs> We don't have time to go into tonight the specifics about each of the major Latin countries, but suffice it to say that today we find ourselves in a world that has recovered a good deal from where it was several years ago. Problems remain, sure, but the international debt crisis has faded. The world has shown it can handle the situation. Indeed, the factors in the world now appear to point toward a bright economic future. Interest rates have come down. The people of the world have confidence again in the leadership of the United States. Something resembling a modest baby boom is underway in this country. Inflation is down almost all over the world. Energy prices have fallen. Taxes have been cut in many countries. There is a worldwide movement towards the private sector and away from government economic intervention. While there is always the possibility of a setback, I would like to be able to say that we should not join the anvil chorus of doom and gloom but rather, in the words of Robert Bleiberg, publisher of Barron's, get ready for the fresh opportunities, philosophic and financial alike, that promise to open up in what, with a little bit of luck, may go down in history as the amazing 80s. But I have one great gnawing doubt that I'm afraid just might throw the whole world into a tailspin. That doubt, I'm sorry to say, is about our own country. 
Let's go back over the four reasons for the Latin American problems. I submit that we appear to have three of the symptoms. First, import substitution, other words for protectionism that's rearing its head in the United States. Second, an overvalued exchange rate policy, a consequence of our large persistent federal deficits. Third, heavy borrowing. At the end of 1982, the United States had net assets abroad of $147 billion. <coughs> In April 1985, the United States became a debtor, net debtor nation for the first time since World War I. Indeed, sometime in 1986, the United States will surpass Brazil as the biggest foreign debtor country in the entire world. The only thing we don't have is the 100 plus years history of financial mismanagement, continuous deficits, ever increasing debt. But time is passing rapidly. These cancers are gradually but persistently effect infecting our society also. Analogies always beg, but there sure are great similarities. Perhaps we should take heed before it's too late. Whether or not we can empirically prove it, I submit that we all know what the basic problem is. It is the enormous fiscal deficit. The tax cuts combined with the increase in military spending, raised interest rates, which in turn created a huge inflow of capital, pushed <coughs> up the dollar, caused unprecedented foreign trade deficits, and impoverished basic American manufacturing companies. If this bleeding artery is not sutured, all the bandaging with various protectionist devices, central bank interventions in the exchange market and the like will not cure the patient. And deep down, I believe we all know two other things. No one, not an individual, not a corporation, not a country, can operate at a continuous deficit without getting into some kind of trouble. So it is with the United States. No one, not an individual, not a corporation, not a nation, is truly master of his own house when he owes money to others. So is it with the United States. In the Gospel according to Luke, we are told, to whom much is given, of him much shall be required. The American people have been given more than any other country in the world. Granted, we worked hard, but there is no other nation so blessed with wonderful land, abundant natural resources, so pleasant and productive a climate, and an ingenious form of government that allows each human being to attain his or her highest potential. Those in the world who are not so fortunate have a right to ask. Will you Americans accept your responsibility to lead, to conduct your affairs in a prudent manner? Will you temporarily lower your fantastic standard of living but a bit so that we may all lead a decent life? Will your political leaders stand up and vote with their consciences, consciences and intellects or will they continue to preach, do as I say and not as I do? Will you allow affluence, laziness, materialism, self-interest to destroy the United States as they did the Roman Empire? Or will you Americans force your elected representatives to take courage, to stand for principle and truth as they did, their, did their forefathers who conceived and built your magnificent country? I have no doubt how the American people will respond, indeed are responding. Do you? Thank you. Well, that was a challenging and, and uh, informative presentation, and uh, we're eager to hear your answers to questions, so I won't comment further. Mr. Stankert will field the questions directly. How are, how are, what is the solution going to be to Latin America if we have free and open trade, since it seems like many American corporations can't uh, hack it in this world? Yeah. That's my word. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, uh, with this trade deficit. There are two sides to a deficit. The, there are two sides to this, and there are the imports and there are the exports. Forty percent of our exports went to less developed countries. 
indeed there's some numbers around, you know, we live in a sea of numbers that almost 20 percent of the deficit is caused by the, our lack of exports to Mexico and Brazil because they can't, they can't buy it. So it's not all one way. Uh, so we, if the Latin countries economies grow, and they have to be able to export to do it, but they also import. Mm -hmm. And that, especially to the United States, is very important because we're the big exporter to Latin America. Uh, so this thing will work out uh, as it goes. If, if the devices are put up to prohibit them from selling their goods here, uh, it's going to make it very difficult. Uh, but you know, with this adjusting of the exchange rate that's supposed to work overnight, uh, maybe that's going a bit too far, but it's going to work. I doubt very much that it will work. Uh, with, with free trade, it's probably better for the Americans price-wise for buying goods, I guess. Oh, sure. This is what happens, you know, if you, if you lower the value of the dollar, a lot of your goods go up. Mm -hmm. If you lower the value of the dollar, American businesses, therefore, can, goods are cheaper home than others. But it also gives them the ability to raise the prices in the United States, mm -hmm. okay? Because the umbrella is sort of lifted, and so it, it breeds inflation. So you go round and round mm -hmm. as to what does, and the, the problem is, and then we come to owing people money. I mean, I don't know how much we owe, $400 billion, some incredible number like that. I was talking about the net part. And so don't you have to keep the interest rate somewhat high to, uh, to, to get the foreigners to invest here? If you don't, we're going to have to take more out of Americans, and the interest rates are going to go up anyhow because of supply and demand, mm -hmm. but it's going to hurt American industry when interest rates go up. So we're getting ourselves with this deficit that constantly sucking in money and rates going up. We're getting ourselves in a spot that's getting very hard to control. And I submit that the band aids well, we'll prohibit this kind of car this year and the other kind of whatever next year, we'll put this on it. So people will figure out how to do it. Also, I think it's not just the value of the, of the currency. When people begin importing things, suddenly you have spare parts, People begin to have brand preferences, and it's not all it's just tinkering with the price that means they're not going to buy it anymore. So it's very difficult, but I think uh, that if we try with the product, it's not going to work, and it's going to make it worse for everybody. I was asked, uh, would I comment, and then that's easy, but then to give my solution or recommendation <laughs> for uh, this seeming problem that uh, we don't really have free trade with certain nations in, uh, in Asia, which is usually Japan, that it's not free and it's not fair and it's, it's rigged on the other side. It's a very difficult problem with Japan. Uh, we have ourselves in a position in a way with Japan, we are the less developed country. We sell them the, the, uh, the what do you call them, the uh, raw materials, they sell us the manufactured goods. Well, you know who's always gotten rich at that game because the value added of the manufactured goods is so much higher. Uh, now, the tariffs they have are really not very high. They're probably no higher than the United States. And with the exception of the famous melons and oranges, they do Im import a lot of goods. But you're in against a very and, and a strong cultural almost preference for Japanese goods. If you see the school system, I mean, the children are brought up that Japan is the best and their goods are the best, and it's pretty hard to argue against them in a way. And uh, so I've said to the Japanese, I don't see why you even go through this. This problem, I want to hell don't you just say we have no more tariffs, you can import anything you want. And what frightens me is I don't think you're going to see much difference in some of those numbers the day after they do it. Uh, so we have to, uh, and then there is a certain thing about uh, not Americans, in a way, not, uh, not, uh, there's a certain truth that we didn't really go after the market. I mean, selling cubic feet refrigerators where they don't have big refrigerators and all the rest of those stories is somewhat uh, true. Uh, and the uh, exchange rate problem is going to run around trying to figure out what it is. Uh, is there, what well, I used to say, do they, affect the exchange right now, of course, we know. We asked them to. Uh, 
the, uh, but, you know, they have so much money that they keep investing it in the United States because our interest rates are higher. And, and they do it, and it's very difficult. But the thing is, with Japan, you know, they also, their wage rates are creeping up. I mean, they're no longer in the business of some of the things that we think about. I mean, no television sets really aren't made in Japan. They can't afford to make them in Japan. They make them in Taiwan, because the, the wage rates are too high and so forth. So I think it's a, a long-term thing, and uh, we have to keep whacking away at it. And uh, I think uh, you really have to keep pushing them to do it. And they keep doing certain things, but it doesn't seem to, to help a lot. But I, I think the one thing, you know, we could sell them the oil. I don't uh, sell them the oil from Alaska, and we buy the oil from the Venezuelans. You know, we we have rules too. How competitive is American? No, okay. How com sorry? How competitive is American labor? Nice narrow question. Uh, and the second one was, uh, if there is a country that is very good for foreign investment, which one is it? Uh, I think American labor can be very competitive if motivated is, is good at it and it's as good as anybody else and uh, and, and can and can, uh, can compete in this world I think there are certain uh, products that are gen that, that are difficult okay that take a lot of labor content but certainly in the and Japan is having the same difficulty but certain in the in the in the uh, I don't want to use that word high tech but in things that you need educated people to do, we can compete with anybody. Uh, now, what country? <laughs> uh, you know, without, without going through long-term, short-term, what do you got in mind? Uh, <laughs> I, I think that, uh, seriously, a long-term investment that I think Brazil is one of the great growing nations of this world and will be an economic goliath in it some years. The problem with investing dollars at the moment is the devaluation of the Crucero. Uh, but if you'd like to live there, you could do very well. Uh, now, uh, I think that uh, if you look out the door, you can see what parts of the world are making the manufactured goods, and we'd have to sit down and talk about what are you doing seriously and so forth. But the Asian, Asia is obviously the part of this world that's on the, that's on the rise. She said there are a lot of similarities between Latin America and Eastern Europe, Eastern Bloc, as it's called, right? Eastern Europe, and that she was surprised to hear that I mentioned Poland and Mexico in the same breath, and could I comment on the similarities? The similarity I commented on was when Poland got in financial trouble, the economic, the financial world closed down on all Eastern Europe. And when Mexico got it, so did it close down to a great degree on the rest of Latin America. That, that was the only similarity. I got to tell you, I've been to both. I don't see many similarities between these two parts of the world. I really don't. Uh, I can't, I would have a hard time coming up with a similarity between Brazil and any country in Eastern Europe. Uh, now, if you're going to go into some of these political things, and certainly these small countries, I suppose. But otherwise, I mean, to some degree, there is government intervention in in the countries of Latin America, as there is in this country. But basically, they're all capitalistic societies, with the exception of the great boogeyman Cuba. Uh, they're, the, they're capitalistic societies, and their standard of living is on the rise, and if you go there, they have a life and about them, and they don't have that, well, that terrible grayness and everything of the rest of the place. Yeah. I was asked, uh, now that we're talking about Brazil, do I believe the IMF has a position to play in Latin America and are not the austerity programs driving it down and so forth. The reason I was smiling so broadly, I don't know why you picked on Brazil except with that accent. Are you Brazilian? No. All right. <laughs> because the Brazilians have a particular thing about the IMF or any other person in the world that tries to tell them what to do. Uh, uh, well, I wonder what the uproar would be in the United States if an IMF team came and we can pick any nationalities you want. Just let me make them up. One from Zaire, one from Tanzania, one from Peru, one from 
Let's throw in a Cuban for the hell of it. Uh, and they, five or six of them come and they spend three months here and they say, now this is what you Americans are going to do. <laughs> Think about that. So you have to understand, people don't like it. And uh, the Brazilians have, for years, paid uh, higher interest rates to private people than they would to go to the IMF. I think the IMF has played a yeoman task in this as a focal point and as a way of, of everybody leaning on to get this thing through. The IMF was set up to take care of what they call short-term disequilibria in the uh, balance of payments. And while you can argue whether three or four years was short-term or not, I think it has. The World Bank has been set up for economic development and growth and so forth, and I think that's the phase that we're now in with some of these countries, and it's their turn to help out. So I think it has a definite place. Are there any serious or responsible people, you said, uh, who say, the hell with it, why don't we just print a lot of money and eliminate the debt? Uh, Latin countries can't do that because they owe another kind of currency. They can't print dollars. All right? The United States, if you flood the country with money, you know, this is an interdependent world. You flood this country with money, you're going to have inflation, hmm? and you're going to have all kinds of trouble, and, and probably a recession, all that stuff. Now, I don't know of any serious or responsible person who has said we ought to do that. And I, I'll go a step further. I don't know any serious or responsible person who said we aren't going to pay. I mean, there are some things we ought to stretch it longer, we ought to make it shorter, and so forth. But no. what has been, my, what has been uh, our uh, response in the bank to uh, Paul Volcker's suggestion and, and Secretary Baker, who started it, suggestion that we should increase some of our outstandings to, uh, or, uh, that's a slang phrase, in, increase some of the money that we have loaned to Brazil, to Brazil excuse me. And, uh, it happens to be the biggest, right? And uh, also, well, I think that it has to be done. And I think if everybody chips in and does his part, we're all for it. Okay, the actual, you know, the actual mechanics of it can go around. But you know, there are some very simple things. I mean, it's very difficult to ask us to increase our loans to Latin America when the bank examiners, who are also part of the federal government, come around and the day after they do it, they say, bango. Bad boy. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Uh, do I think this country ought to get back on the gold standard? And if we did, what effect would it have on the world debt? I don't think you could go back on the gold standard. Life has passed you by. Uh, and I've got to tell you, I've never sat down and figured out what would happen to this debt if we did go back on it. I, I, I'm gonna, I don't know. But I'm, I don't think you could get back on it. Mexico, the gentleman says, is more important to us than Brazil because it's our neighbor. and for. Two, two other reasons. One, they can buy our goods, and number two, uh, number three, rather, uh, I think you said we don't want 20 or 30 million more Mexicans, was your words. Well, I'm not saying uh, negative, negative. No, I understand that, right. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, but I mentioned Brazil in a couple of contexts. Number one, uh, I believe that Brazil I think Brazil, as an economic unit, will outdistance Mexico in our lifetime. Uh, it's bigger, it has more natural resources, and very basically it can feed itself. So whatever they export, they can use to produce productive equipment. Mexico, unfortunately, is in a position of selling oil to feed itself. Now, but, but Mexico is our neighbor. And uh, it's very important to this country for everything so they can buy things and so forth. And I think in, uh, we should do all we can to take care of them. I just think that uh, Brazil is a bigger, I was mentioning the size of these economies. Brazil is a bigger country, it's a bigger economy, and I think it will grow faster. Could I comment on India, <laughs> uh, which as how it sits relative to Mexico and Brazil and the others as a, as a power, as an economic power? First of all, it has 700 or 750 million people, so it's a gigantic country. Uh, the foreign investment in India in the last, since the independence has been very low because they deliberately kept it that way. Uh, there are signs now that it's beginning to change. They've tried to have a managed economy of 700 million people, which has kept them back. As an economic power, I don't believe it's in the, 
I don't know the numbers, but I don't believe it's in the, in the same league as, as Brazil, although there are great signs that it's beginning to change. Uh, first of all, the first question was, uh, the second one I've been waiting for so, so long, I can't remember the first one. <laughs> All right, are we turning into a service economy? I think that's pretty obvious. The answer is yes, uh, depending on how you define it and high tech. The answer is yes. I mean, uh, there are certain kinds of products that are made in this world that take very unskilled labor and low, and you can do it any place where the labor is low, and people want to do it is another reason. Uh, and I think the United States, as indeed is Japan, is turning into a high technology generally speaking, in some kind of service economy. While the heavy manufacturing, of the, to get back to this, I don't want to be an apologist for Brazil all the time, but they have, you know, they have a huge iron ore deposits right on the water in that Karajas place. The Japanese showed them how to build a steel mill. I mean, you literally, you just buy, you buy a, a steel mill, and you have some, you can run it, and they can, it's, uh, the, the labor rates are very low. It's literally miles and miles from anything, so the pollution devices aren't as expensive and so forth. How the hell are you going to compete with it? In basic, so you can see basic ingots are being brought to the United States. And, and so I, I think that's, that's going on. Now, as to how do I think the American people are going to react and why did I say lower the standard of living? And how are we going to affect with the others? Well, I think maybe reshape our approaches to right. I think that uh, the reason I said temporarily lower, I presume that if I was going to be asked that question, I was going to say raise the taxes a bit, that I presume that somehow or other lowers the standard of living a bit for a while. Uh, but I think for a very short period of time. Uh, and, uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson said once that the few rich will never survive next to the many poor. And so somehow or other, we have to keep this under control as to how high compared to others and so forth. I don't have any doubt our standard of living will exceed any other place in the world by leaps and bounds for as long as you and I have to work. But do you think that's at the expense of the third world? Is that what you're saying? No, I really don't think it's at the expense of the third world because, uh, you know, if you're going to trap me in these words like trickle down and all that <laughs> stuff. I, I think, in a way, by their being able to sell these products, to our country that can buy, and they also have been raised. And over a long period of time, these two things will come somewhat together. I look back, when I was the head of our business in Asia in 1970, and I go there now, uh, our host was talking about when he was in Taipei years ago. I mean, I go to see Taipei now. I can't believe this is the place where we opened this branch years ago. I mean, it's, I can't believe it's the same place. And flashy cars <coughs> and all this stuff is going on. Could I describe the business of the Chase Capital Markets Corporation? <laughs> I'm getting sick of it. We, you know what an investment bank is in the United States? Okay. That's what we're going to be. All right. Now, we are stopped in the United States as a commercial bank from engaging in the securities market. But we can do it every place else in the world, with the exception of Japan, where our guys wrote the rules in 1947. Right? Uh, <laughs> there, instead of the Glass-Steagall Act, it's known as Article 65, okay? Uh, but other places we do. And, and to the extent we can in the United States, we're going to do it too. And maybe, and that, at the, we're not allowed, we're going to get the name investment bank in it one way or the other. And I think I figured out how to do it. We can't have a legal corporation called an investment bank in the United States. We can outside and do have. Uh, why are we going to do this? The basic business that built the Chase National Bank years ago was l lending money to large American corporations. Uh, large Amer that was the business. We were the middleman. People put the money in the bank and we loaned it to, I don't know, General Motors and U.S. Steel and all the rest of them. When I first worked in a bank and I was one of those, that's all we did. People called up all day long. We loaned them 90 days here, 90 days there. No big American company today borrows money on a short-term basis from a bank, right? They cut out the middleman. They go to this commercial paper market, right? The middleman lost, just like the coffee merchants are gone. When General Foods got big enough, it wasn't going to pay some guy to tell them where Nigeria was. <laughs> 
And the, and, the, and the same thing, a big company's not going to pay us in the middle, and indeed they don't. So this is, so this, and outside the United States, uh, for a whole variety of reasons, a lot of the same thing is going on. We used to make these big syndicated loans, which is what I'm here talking about. Today there are hardly any syndicated loans. The loans are put, given right to the people that we call them. You can go to the Bronx Zoo. We've got tigers, cats, we've got all these kind of acronyms or things called sniffs and roughs and toughs and <laughs> all the rest of this, which is a way of the money going from the borrower right to the lender, who's the individual or the insurance company or whatever it is. And we get in the middle on a trading operation, and that's what we're going to do to some extent, because we have to. Our business has got to go with the crowd. I think we waited too long in this country. And that's where that re my wife says, you ought to get rid of that ridiculous name. Right? <laughs> Is China re 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 going in for more free trade and uh, how do I see China? Uh, I got you, I find China amazing. When I was out there in the 1870s, I never thought I would go to see China. You go to Hong Kong and you see these guys. You go to Macau and the guides tell you people got machine gunned on the other side all day and all that stuff. I never thought I'd see China. All of a sudden, Nixon went to China one day, and the following year, I went. <laughs> okay. David and I went, and I was the first American banker to go to China. Uh, David being Rockefeller, who really got invited. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the only way in, the only way in in Asia, from Asia, was to walk across a railroad bridge in Wolu Station in Hong Kong. That was the only way. I was used to not having, knowing, not knowing where I was going for the next two weeks. I'm not sure David ever had that in his whole life, but the Chinese would never tell you where you were going, so he let me walk across the bridge first. <laughs> <laughs> so some, someday I'm going to write down I was the first, which is true. That, I mean, it was in the days of Mao. I, we were there for 10 days. I only saw one Eastern Europe delegation of some kind, one Japanese, and maybe one or two other foreigners in 10 days. I mean, this was cut off from the world. I went there last February, and I, I said, rather January, and I celebrated my birthday in Maxime's restaurant in Beijing, <laughs> which I suggest there are many Chinese restaurants, much better. But uh, the change is remarkable. But don't kid yourself, it's still China. China is a very poor country with one billion people living on two thirds of the land, arable land mass of the United States. You know, when you look out, and those of us who have beautiful homes, and you see those grass lawns, I wonder how we'd have to live if 10 people had to live on that. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very poor place. I wonder, it's very organized. I wonder if we had a billion people, could we live the way we live where everybody more or less does what he wants? I'm not so sure. Uh, also, China was humiliated. Very <coughs> proud people. China was humiliated for 100 or 150 years, and they're not about to get back into that kind of mess. So they've done a lot of things, but they will control their own destiny, and they will control what they import and what they export, and they're very, very frugal with their money. Uh, you see them come to New York. They came to the United Nations. They didn't rent anything. They bought a building. The Bank of China came. Same thing. They buy a building. They're not going to rent anything. <laughs> they're very good. And so I think it will be a long time, but they're obviously coming out on the world but I think, you know, in the 1920s or 30s, it was oil lamps to China. And then now everybody in New Zealand sits around and figures, boy, one lamp chop per person, one billion each year, wow. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Huh? For a long, it's a very poor country. And as long as nobody has too much, they all have enough. But the changes, even in saying that, the changes in 10 years are remarkable. I never thought ever that I would sit in Seoul, South Korea, South Korea, at the IMF meeting, and entertain on Sunday night the delegation to the International Monetary Fund of the People's Republic of China. I mean, think of that. Unbelievable. But I think it would be a long time. <laughs> Well, we, we all know that now that a, 
an evening with Francis Stankert is informative, educational, and thoroughly enjoyable. We thank you very much. <laughs>